You're listening to Fit Pro Sessions with Parallel Coaching, episode number two, season two. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. In today's podcast, Hayley and I answer your questions, all the common questions when starting out as a fitness professional. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Hayley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work and that with the right structure, support and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. I am super excited for this one. Following the feedback from season two, episode one last week, Haley, how cool was it? Absolutely awesome. Amazing. Thank you so much for all your downloads, all your comments, and the, all, all of your uh, five star five reviews. Star there reviews. was loads <laughs> of them. It was wicked. So, re- really, really do appreciate that because that allows us to help more people reach more people with the podcast. And this week, we're focusing on your questions. So, it's all about Fit Pro beginnings. So, maybe you've recently qualified, or maybe you're just on the brink of being qualified and the certificate's going to land on your doorstep or you're going to qualify in the next few months. Either way, this podcast is for you if you're ready to kick start. And I think this is probably relevant for a lot of veteran fit pros as well, having had maybe three or four months out from coronavirus where yes. we've not been training clients. And so you're getting back to it and you're thinking like, there's some bug bearing questions of how do I make this my time? And I genuinely believe that coronavirus, where you've had 14, 15, 16 weeks off, has kind of leveled the playing field. So it almost doesn't matter whether you're brand new or you've got 15 years experience like me. You're we're all starting afresh with a kind of a a different set of problems with with clients. And I think it's just making sure that all of our questions have a really sound answer. And this is what today's episode is all about. Exactly. Answering your questions as you start out as a fit pro in your fit pro beginnings. And we've had loads of questions. And what I actually really loved about these is they're not just relevant now, but we've seen these questions pop up year for the last after decade. year. For the last <laughs> decade. So they're always going to be relevant. They're always going to be appropriate. And you might just have one question in your mind that we're going to answer. But in hearing everybody else's questions and answers, that's when you get access to all the other things that you didn't even know to ask. Completely. That's really And I powerful. think one question, if you don't know the answer, can keep you stuck in that place with, and stops you from moving on. Yes. So you're like, I just want to get going. I just want to get going. But you can't think of all of the other kind of get going tasks or questions yeah. until you've had the answer to that one niggling question. To you, it might be absolutely massive, this question. But actually, once you hear the answer, you think, oh, that was actually really obvious. Yeah. And it's kind of a, and it's usually, you know, I'm going to say the small, silly questions that yield the biggest results. So what we've done or what Haley's done is uh, collate all the questions. We're going to put some names to people that, that, are, that, that sent these questions in. But there were so many questions all the same. We'd be here just listing like Jenny, Helen, Sarah, all ask the same, the same one. So, <laughs> yeah. so we're when just... there's a question that lots of people have asked, we're just putting the question in. Completely. Um, but absolutely So the awesome. big five. So we've chunked these into the big five. You probably saw us both just jump down then because our uh, notes on the computer computer screen just went blank and we were like ah what do we do (laughs) so we're gonna go with the big five questions and I think we've got like maybe 20 odd more and these are the ones that we've heard every year for from so many fit pros so we were like these are the big do you know a number one question came through is do I need insurance and where do I get insurance from now then not a week goes by (laughs) not a day goes (laughs) past so insurance any fit pro, whether you're a PT, Pilates, exercise to musica, <laughs> um, kids fitness, it doesn't matter what discipline you are, it doesn't matter what you're doing in business, you do need to get insurance. And insurance doesn't need to, it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. You can, just like when you pay your insurance with your car, you can pay insurance monthly. You can pay insurance outright for the entire year. Yeah. And we don't have any uh, affiliation to any insurance companies. So, you know, the, the top kind of, free i suppose that that we hear and see an awful lot that people get good um good responses about good feedback for first one is insure for sport yeah number four in the middle number four in the middle and i actually use that personally as well for my clients i think i pay something like 65 pound so that's um 
British pounds. So yeah. we've got a lot of uh, listeners out in the Middle East, a lot yeah. in the States, a lot in Australia as well, yeah. oddly. Um, so that's 65 pounds, which isn't a great deal of money spread across 12 months. Yeah, that allows exactly. me to know that I'm covered uh, in case something should go wrong. And I think yeah. that's £5 million. Yeah, so it's up to a £5 million pound public liability insurance. Go. So you're looking for a public liability that's a £3 million or more, really, is what you're probably looking for. So Insure for Sport is one of them. Fit Pro comes up a lot and they've actually done, I've been really impressed at how much support they've given out over the COVID-19 lockdown. There's been lots of updates to their policies and things. So and I'm sure you'd all agree cool. it's been a nightmare kind of deciphering the what new you can and can't, can't do. You do. And, and Fit Pro have been really good at kind of busting through all of that noise and saying you can now go and train six people, including you. You can now go and train 30 people outside, including you. And it's been really good. And then the final one would be you could get your insurance through um, Simpspa or Reps, which yes. is, I suppose, uh, no, they're not a governing body. Uh, they're a, um, what are they? It used to be a bit of a union. A really, union, yeah, I suppose, I suppose so. But body. we will talk yeah. about that very shortly. But ultimately, you do need to go and get insurance. Yeah. Fact, simple. Public liability insurance. Don't overcomplicate this. Don't overcomplicate it. Keep type... it as simple as mm -hmm. if you were looking for car insurance. Just go onto Google, <laughs> type in type in insure for sport, get on the blower, get on the phone, give them a call, wham, bam, wada, bing, bang, insurance get done. Get it done, tick. But you'd be amazed at how many people have this as a barrier and hurdle, and I can see why. Yeah. Okay. I think also it becomes a barrier and hurdle here because it's reality. Mm. Once you're insured, you can now actually go and do Nothing's gonna it. Stop you Nothing's going to stop you. And I think that's what some of these questions do. They allow us to stay stuck. And maybe we do want to stay stuck. It's a different question. Maybe that's going to come up in episode number three, which is all it about certainly will in episode which three. is all about self belief. Uh, next one Question down. Question number two, is, should I register with Reps or Simspa? So it's not compulsory to register with Reps or Simspa. I actually used to work for Reps uh, many, many years ago. I did like my experience with Reps. However, uh, the pull towards Parallel was far greater. Um, a lot of people see Reps or Simspa they've now joined as a, as a compulsory measure. And I suppose that's what Simpspa and reps are wanting you to to do is so one big register one of big register exercise of exercise professionals um but it's not compulsory you don't need to sit there and go should i should i shan't i should i shan't i don't know it's entirely up to you mm. at the end of the day um it is something you need to pay for if you do decide you want to do it yeah. um and you need to upload your certificates and achieve certain points every year. I think the main uh, thing with, with Sinspar and Reps is what they do is they um, acknowledge training providers for accredited, standardised training. Mm. So in order to stay on the register um, and be a member, you have to complete a certain amount of courses that are allocated a certain amount of points every year. So, for example, a level two fitness instructor, which we offer, gives you 20 Sinspar Reps points. OK, which allows you to stay on the register for that year. Yeah. Now, if you don't go away and do any further updates or training or CPD, ultimately what the this membership is saying is you have not stayed current. You have not stayed up to date. So what they're I suppose they're promoting is ensuring that fitness professionals are up to date and are going through standardized continual professional, continual professional development. Yeah. OK, exactly. there we go. So, so your choice, your choice. But that doesn't stop you from going to update your knowledge elsewhere. I suppose the only downside to reps and simp spa is it recognises fitness training providers and the training they offer. That doesn't mean that you could go and do a NLP course well outside the industry mm. or you could go and do a sales and marketing course well outside of the industry. You're still progressing. You're still progressing, but you're not obviously allocated your Simp Spa points now. OK, so it's just that recognition of where do I see my own training going? What do I need? As opposed to I think this is a key point rather than turning around every year and saying, right, I've got to go and do a kettlebell course in order to stay on the reps register. Yeah. That might not be your problem. Yeah. You might not need to do a kettlebell course right now it might be better for you to do a bookkeeping course. it might be better for you to do a bookkeeping yeah completely so inside your business it's actually recognizing what is my problem how am i progressing as an individual as a, as a small business 
I like the principle behind it in that you're always doing something every year to progress yourself and you might create that structure mm. yourself without necessarily going through something like reps or Simspo where you say this year I've got X amount of budget and that's um, that's going directly towards training and progressing myself. What do I feel the need is to do this year? Exactly. Yeah, Wicked. Nice. Next question down is, what parkour or fitness forms should I use? So I'm going to go straight in with a shameless plug here, I think. Well, you know what? It helps so much. <laughs> it's helped so many people. So we have a FitPro startup kit, which has 35 odd forms in, which you can download to Word, PDF. There's Excel documents in there as well. It's $9.99 for Christ's sake. It's like... With, the tiniest investment, I think, for the amount of value you get. And it's 9.99 lifetime access, so you can download them as many times as you want. To it's multiple just devices. But the beauty of it is you can upload your... We show you where to upload your logo. It's easy to upload your logo, brand it yourself, change the colour. And we've left it so it literally says fill in the blanks. So you can personalise it very easy and very quickly. Exactly. So it's not just park use. You've got um, weight predictor charts. You've got calorie trackers. You've got um, program cards. Program cards for risk assessments. Risk assessments. So we'll drop the link below. But ultimately, having all those documents, they're all standardised. They all look and feel the same. When you do give them out to your client, you've just crushed the amount of time that it takes to go and collate this or make it yourself. And that's why we put it together, is that we found that a big sticking point for a lot of fit pros was, oh, now I've got to create my forms. And they'd spend ages creating all their forms, which means it's longer than before you start working with a client. Um, so this just makes it super easy. And people get stuck in the process rather than get stuck into the end outcome. Exactly. And it's easier to stay stuck here going well i'm still working towards it because obviously it's super valuable you need to do it but it stops you from doing the very thing you want to do awesome cool. which is probably the scariest part the scariest part and this one also keeps people stuck is how much should i charge Ooh. so this is question number four how much should i charge you know how how long is a piece of string how much do you want to earn I think, yeah, no, we covered this a little bit last week and we're yeah. going to we're gonna pick it up, I think, every episode for this season two. Yeah. But if you want to earn, let's say, let's keep the maths really simple for, <laughs> for the podcast, for my brain right now. Let's say you want to earn £24,000 a year. There's 12 months in a year. Now that's £2,000 per month. Yes. There's four weeks per month. You're going to earn £500 a week. Or your maths is better than mine. Let's just say you're going to work Monday to Friday. You're going to earn £100 a day. Yes. OK, so you need to put together some kind of signature program whereby it's the equivalent of £100 a day. But there's so many ways of stripping a cat here. OK, no. not that I think anybody's ever stripped a cat. <laughs> I don't know where that saying comes from. Yeah. That'd be really good to know. It's a bit weird, isn't <laughs> it? It is a bit weird. But ultimately, you know, you could have um, 24 clients pay you £1,000. So um, we've had a couple of people on this podcast. I think uh, Darren Stock you know, uh, who was episode number, quite early on, episode top 10, yeah. who does nutrition coaching, he charges um, higher ticket, but works with them on a much closer proximity. So he has less clients. Less clients across the year, but increases his price. Exactly. I think it comes down to how much do you want to earn that year? At the end of the day, if you're going to replace this for your job and you're going to make that career switch, that career change, and you're earning... £20,000 a year, do you want to earn the same £20,000 doing something you love? Or do you want to earn a little bit more? Or do you want to earn a little bit less? Now you've got the freedom to choose. And it sounds really odd. You know, you don't necessarily go, you, you go for a job, you go for a job interview and they kind of dictate how much you're worth. Now the, the, the tide has changed. You can dictate how much you're worth. Yes. And I think we, as a society, as a, as a world, we're given this notion of what is a an acceptable income for the year what's the average salary now you can be in that position as a business owner regardless of how big or small you want to make it and say how much do i want to earn how much do i need to bring in and it's a really different way of calculating it and a lot of people when they start out thinking about what to charge they're worried because they think that it's a reflection of themselves that they're selling themselves oh so, great point oh, i can't sell myself for 50 pound an hour because this PT that's been doing it for years is selling at £30 an hour. And they have a self-worth, self-value situation rather than thinking yes. about the outcome or the result that you're creating as a fit pro. Because your client is paying you for the result 
not, not for you and your time. That's just goosebumpling. Just just go and pause and rewind what Haley <laughs> just said. I can't, I can't say it. Yeah, <laughs> completely. <laughs> you, because you, the, the client, your clients are not going to pay. They're not paying you to babysit. They're not paying you to stand next to a treadmill. They're not paying you to take them through an hour's workout. They're paying you for an outcome, for a result. Yeah. So just like if you went to the supermarket now, you went to Tesco's, that our other <laughs> supermarket. Other leading chains available. <laughs> and you bought tomato ketchup, Tommy K, Heinz. You're not paying for, you're paying for the whole thing, aren't you? You're paying for the outcome of pouring that, squirting that Tommy K on your nice crispy chips. Exactly. And when you go to a restaurant, you're paying for the whole experience, not just because you've got some tomato sauce and some chicken. Exactly. Like it's, it's the experience that you're paying, you're paying for, for and the, the result. And the journey. You're paying for that journey. So when it comes down to pricing, you're not you're not pricing up your hour, your worth, your time, their time with you. You're pricing up the whole package and you're not just going to be with them for the hour next to a treadmill or or busting out a, a body weight circuit whatever it might be or a pilates or yoga session they're go you know you're going to take them through the accountability you're going to be reaching out to them every day every other day you're going to be guiding them on nutrition giving them a nutrition advice you're going to be helping them pass the barriers the hurdles the mental uh, blocks in their mindset of can they do it when are they going to do it how are they going to fit this in you're going to hold them accountable you're going to keep them motivated inspired you're going to give them voice messages daily notes you might send them a letter in the mail you're dead you're getting them from a to b awesome yeah so think of it like that rather than how much am I worth per hour? Bob yes. down the road only pays uh, charges fifteen pound an hour. Therefore, I can only charge fifteen pound an hour. Bob down the road, consider this: is not in charge of your outcome and not in charge of your what you're worth or going to dictate how much you can charge. And there's also so many variables about: is it a class? Is there groups? Is it one to one? Is it premium? Do you offer the nutrition stuff in between? Is it just a singular session? There's so many different variables, which is probably what I love the most about the fitness industry. But maybe There's that's so why much. it's so complicated. Maybe mm. that's what, because it's, it's like having... It's not like us saying it has to be £20. Like if it. you went into the petrol <laughs> station and they just had Mars bars, you would just go but for a Mars, Mars bar. But if they've, the fact they've got a Mars bar, a Crunchy, a Snickers, a Dairy Milk, you're like, oh, it was too much mm. choice. So now it comes down to there's lots of choice of what you could do. So my answer to you here is, what do you want to do? If you love the idea of training one-to-one, -one, go and do one-to-one. -one. There's lots of noise on the internet at the moment, bloody Facebook saying one-to-one -one training is dead. No, it's not. Let Behave. It's not dead, is it? There's loads of people, thousands, millions of people who want one-to-one -one training. Let's be real with it. You might be like, I want to train people in a group, in a park, and there's not many, there's loads of people doing it in my area. So what? Go and do it your way. They can't, no one can be you. No one can be you. So ignore the noise and go, right, what do I want to do? If I'm going to give up my career over here, this, this job I'm doing, in favour of something I love doing, Let's make sure I love doing it. Oh, I love that. Yeah, don't 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 give up the job over here and go, oh God, I dread my nine till five. And then come over into fitness, get qualified and go, God, I really would love to do one-to-one, -one, but I find myself doing boot camps. I don't want to do boot camps. Don't do boot camps. And don't put yourself in a place where you end up resenting what yeah. you've moved to because you're charging too little. So yeah. make sure that you've got that happy balance. So you just create what it is you want. And then no. that kind of leads into the next. This really, question got asked I, yeah. so many times. So I put this question in here in this order because it leads on so nicely. So what's the average salary for a personal trainer? I'm going to say there isn't an average salary. If you type into Google, we wrote I'll a blog a about. We put a blog. We made notes. a blog about this because there is no average salary. So you've got someone like Joe Wicks, um, body coach, who's earning five million pound a year. That's very different to somebody who is part-time, uh, I'm going to say part-time uh, fit pro, they're a mum, they've got a part-time job as well, and alongside they're literally doing a couple of classes per week, uh, per week, they might only be earning 50, now, 60 pound a week. Let's stay with this, because I think, you know, I it's think... Let's stay with Joe Wicks. So I saw a video the other day on Instagram where Joe Wicks has put together this two and a half minute kind of snippet of his life as a trainer. And he said 10 years ago, he was cycling from Canada down the, I think the west coast of 
of the States, 2000 miles with a mate, just loving life. And he's like, I'm not really hugely academic, uh, he said, and I just knew that I wanted to get into fitness. So he, he helped his friends, he helped his family, apparently worked out with his mum and dad and said, you know, I love this, why don't I get into fitness? And so he lived in London, I think uh, near Surbiton in London, sets up a boot camp, couldn't uh, afford a car, so he had a bike and a trailer, put all of his kit in the trailer, cycled however far across London. In his head, he said he thought he was going to end up with like 20, 30 people and like three <laughs> people showed up. And then in the pouring rain, no one would turn up, hugely demoralised. He would stand outside train stations and tube stations with big banners promoting his service and 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 really grafting, really hustling. And he yeah. built a boot camp. He thought, you know, well, I'll jump onto this social media thing. And then he starts the, the, the Lean in 15, the 15 second clips on Instagram and suddenly starts to get traction. And the whole concept of this, this, this short video he made was, here's my oh, my 10 year overnight success. Ooh, I love that. And, here's, and what I loved about that in terms of the average salary, you could look at him and go, well, I'm not like Joe Wicks now. I, you know, that's not average. We're earning five, 10 million pound a year, whatever. You're right, it's not average. But what is average is his journey. And he, you know, at the end of it, he said, you know, very clearly, where are you going to be in 10 years time? Nice. Yeah, so rather than think about what's the average salary and kind of beat ourselves up and end up in this kind of turmoil of thoughts and emotions around, I've only got a few clients, I'm not earning enough, this isn't going to be able to be sustainable, yeah? Play the longer game. Play the longer game. I remember standing out in the in the pouring rain doing kettlebell sessions with just one or two people. Um, the mud, the and mud, the snow. The yeah. snow. Um, but that went on to lead into massive boot camps and huge numbers. Yeah. But after two or three weeks, two or three months, the first couple of years, I could have easily have given up. I'll be honest. There were so many points where I'm like, I just, I'm ready to give up. This is hard. But no. I love what I do. And those early reps are what allows you to become uh, more confident. To be and able this to is do... the segue back to, <laughs> segue, <laughs> this is a segue back to episode number one last week, which is why did you start? Yeah. Remind yourself all the time why you're here, why you're starting and ignore the noise of what the average salary is. So what if the average salary is £16,000 in a club or 18000 in a club? No one cares. And like our last point about how much you should charge, it's so individual for you. Yeah. The, the nicest thing about the fitness industry is you can choose. It's not like it has to only be this amount in this industry. You can choose what you want to earn, how many hours you put in, how you want it to look. Yep. So it really is so individual. What I will say, and again, this isn't meant to hopefully not feel overwhelming too early on, but is to have a couple of streams of income, even as a new fit pro. So you might have some... So not have your eggs all in one basket. Not all have your eggs in one basket. So you might have some people doing one-to-one. -one. You might have a small kind of circuit boot camp, even if it is in, you know, we're in Pilates or yoga, where you do like semi-private stuff. And then you might do some online stuff as well using Zoom, which means you've got... You're, you're allowing the people that can't attend your one-to-one -one or afford your one-to-one -one or can't attend your group-based class, they can still do you online. And then your one-to-one -one people might still want to do some stuff online. So you can bring different clients into to different services. And naturally within them, they have different price points because exactly. a one-to-one -one is different to a group. Exactly. Yeah, so if nice. you have multiple entry price points, you can appeal to a slightly wider range of people, even though you might be niched down and you might just work with one type of person. And the other nice thing about that is you might find out that you like doing one thing more than another because you've tried more things. Yeah, great point. Um, and you also might find that one's more successful than the other. Exactly. Yeah, completely. <laughs> cool. Cool. Let's jump into them. So now we're talking about the setup so the setup of your business so do i need this to be a limited company so in a word no no <laughs> um i would always say when you're starting out as a fit pro start as a sole trader because it's just going to be much more straightforward or partnership if that's where you're going but generally a sole trader so you're essentially in fact look up just go gov.uk sole trader it will tell you everything you need to know about the rules of sole trader yep. um and then later on if you feel you want to become limited you can and the nice thing about becoming limited when you get to that point is it the main difference is it limits you from the risk associated to your business. 
So it means that if somebody, for example, sued you or there was a problem, it means you're not part of that. The business takes that. Yeah. Um, so that's the main difference. But there are other costs involved as a limited company. But so being, giving a choice, I'd always start simple. Yeah, just go simple. Just be uh, and, and you do your normal um, HMRC government gateway um self-assessment self at the end of the year yeah. simple it's actually quite straightforward the only time that, that may not be appropriate is if you've got a facility and you want to protect that a little bit more sometimes you might want to go into limited completely so uh next one down do i need to keep all of my receipts and all of my payments yes yes you do like neil mentioned self-assessment is going to be important so whether you're a sole trader or a limited you do need to keep record of everything i don't suggest you do this manually because you're going to get a pile of receipts that you don't want to work through um, so instead, I think the easiest way to do it is use some, I use QuickBooks, I love it. Um, I think it's really straightforward. They've got an app, you can take a photo of your receipts, you can get it all linked in together. It's simple. Um, but there's tons of different ways you can do it. I have one learner that literally, one fit pro, that literally just use an Excel spreadsheet to map simple. all of the incomings and all of the outgoings. And I also recommend to keep it simple, you just have a separate bank account for your business. So, like for example, yeah. Neil's got his own bank account, but he's also got his Neil Bergman FitPro bank account, so that if any payments that co go through from a FitPro point of view, we can track how much he's earned in that year. Exactly. Very Otherwise, if you're doing it from your personal account, you've then got like I don't know, <sighs> your fifteen pound on diesel that week, and your Tesco shop, and your and your wages go in. Wage, and you yeah, can't it's see just a it bit all. messy. Just keep it really, yeah. really simple. Again, don't overcomplicate it. Just go, go and set up a bank, set up your self-assessment, register with HMRC, off you go, keep your receipts, um, what, what you earn, what you spend out. Perfect. There we go. Uh, Mandy asks, what equipment should I have? Um, do I need a blood pressure monitor, calipers? Um, for the fat mass calculations. For fat mass calculations and that type of thing. So, I think it's really nice to have a little starter kit. Yes, and I it, do. It doesn't need to be massive. I'm just going to put a little caveat on there because I think a later question is, do I, I don't have much of a budget. Mm. So if you've not got much of a budget, then I probably wouldn't worry with hardly any kit, really, in the grand scheme of things. Ultimately, it's how do you see yourself operating? I think a blood pressure monitor is a good place to start. It's kind mm. of a bare minimum because that allows you to really thoroughly check is someone um safe to start and following a park you yeah. um, i think you know go back to when we first started it was standard practice upon a gym induction or someone joining the health club had to do a blood pressure. it was a it was a blood pressure check so i mean i think it comes down to how do you want to operate but yeah a blood pressure monitor you might do calipers um, most of these are quite cheap you can get them for like a blood pressure monitor for like 20 quid no, even that, i think i saw them on amazon for like a tenner the other day there you go um, you can get loads of different types of calipers. Um, the cheapest are like a pound. A couple of quid. Again, there's lots <laughs> of uh, accuracy and validity in, in some of those, maybe. Rather but you than don't need the... to spend hundreds of pounds. Not at all, not at all. So when it comes to like, what do I need? What equipment should I set up with? How do you want to operate? How do you want to operate? And I don't want to sit on the fence too much there. But, you know, when I started my 5am club, you know, I could have had a, a decent budget, I'll be honest, and I decided to do all of my uh, boot camps outside. So I bought mats and I bought hand towels because I used hand towels as the main bit of equipment that people could use body weight between each other for rowing, for loads of different exercise, upright rows, lap pull downs. I basically used a hand towel as my own pulley machine. Awesome. Um, so those hand towels were like free for a, a five pound from a local shop. Mm. They weren't funky. They weren't branded. They were all black. And I just used, um, you know, those interlocking mats that you put down in your garage. Yeah. I just bought a pack, of, uh, you know, a couple of packs of those from Halfords. And each one of those was my mat for, for the lads. Perfect. And it, and it literally was that simple. And I think after that, I bought some cones. And I think my initial investment was, was under about 35, 40 quid. Yeah. And I'm still using some of that kit four years on. Yeah. Um, it doesn't need to be funky. It doesn't, it doesn't need, need to, to look great. It just needs... Do you don't need to brand everything not either. At all, not <laughs> at all. And I think that's a really good point is actually a lot of people love the process of getting lots of uh, kit <laughs> <laughs> and lots of um, merchandise and making it look and feel really professional. But ultimately, I think, in my opinion, it comes down to how do I get my client the goal? You know, like you've got a parallel uniform. I never wear it. We, we don't wear it. No, we don't wear it. We don't. We, like it's just not needed, in my opinion. 
You know, we don't have parallel pens. We don't have a parallel pen pot. We don't have parallel mugs. We don't have parallel hats. It, like, like all I care about is, are you knowledgeable and do you have confidence? Are you getting the result? Yeah, me having a branded mat doesn't get the client a result. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, what that does is that if you're going down the route of getting things branded, is that it creates longer time frame before you get started. It creates more getting stuck. It creates more... Yeah. Uh, obstacles yeah um, but that Mandy's question was about um, different equipment that she needs so I think you answered that really nicely you don't need to have anything think about what testing you would want to do with your client based on their goal which and that's, is the, that's, next that's the next question it leads quite nicely is what fitness test should I do on a consultation and again it comes down to I suppose how you've been taught but how you lay out your first couple of sessions we teach this double consultation style, um, which is, you know, if, uh, if you want to know more, just reach out to us on that one. But ultimately, the consultation, I don't think you probably can do any test in the first consultation. I think that's all about getting to know the person. Are they a good fit for you? Are you a good fit for them? Build up some relationship, build up some rapport, um, have a giggle, have a laugh, find out some key information. And maybe session two, consultation two, that's where you might do some initial movement. So yeah. testing. So think about what their goals are yes. and how you're going to measure that they are progressing in those goals. This is why you get smart goals drilled into you like, and you have to repeat them at level two, level three. Um, smart goals are really key because they teach you to look at measurability. So think about the goal they want to achieve. How are you going to measure that they've changed from week zero to week eight or week four or whatever it might be? What's the progress measurement? And then that's what you need to measure. So an example of that, if they've got a weight loss goal, you, they, to you have to measure their weight. And again, this is a big barrier for so many lighter? people. Maybe we have our own internal hang ups around weight. But if you want to measure, if you've got a weight loss goal, you have to know the weight of the body. Mm. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna weigh something for cooking, yeah, you need to know the weight of that prod produce, right? Yeah. So you've got to weigh it. It's the same thing. So you need to weigh in week one, <laughs> week four, week eight. And there's various ways around of doing that or when you would uh, weigh somebody um, based on gender as well. Yeah. And then if they want fat loss, you'd need to you make know, sure there's a specific fat loss calculation, yeah. whether that's calipers if, or bioimpedance. If they've, if they've got a running goal, what is the specifics of that running goal? Is it to be able to complete a certain, excuse me, a certain distance or is it a certain time? In which and case, what can they do now? What can <laughs> they do now in a certain time or a certain yeah. distance? Perfect. So just create that relevant to the goals that they have. I will say like one thing on that is some fitness tests can be really demanding. So it's making sure in the, the early stages of, of you working with them, it's mm. not so overwhelmingly demanding that the, the, the new client, um, it hinders your relationship with them or their adherence to the programme so going forward. So I thought of one rep max is when you said Yeah, that. exactly. So if you're, so you're yeah, going wicked. all the way to one rep max, which hurts <laughs> um, <laughs> and also hurts the next day or two because of DOMS especially for a brand new client that maybe hasn't even approached well, 12 hours let, Let's yet. get rid of the, 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 the word hurt here. Ultimately, we're saying that their bones, their joints, their connective tissue, it's the anatomy ready. and physiology isn't ready for a one RM test. So it's about choosing an appropriate test for where they are now. Nice. Yeah. And that could be really discomforting for them in the session. Same as if you're getting to a, a submaximal VO2, VO2 max test. Yeah, completely. That could so be really demanding. Somebody might want to do a 10K in 12 weeks time and do the best they can. And you think, well, actually the 12 minute Cooper run test would, would suit here. But first off, do they want to run 12 minutes all out in the first couple of sessions, can they do that? What what is what does this build them up or knock them down? Where does it leave them on their self efficacy? So it might be that I choose a, a test that's that still tests them accurately for their cardiovascular fitness now, but knowing that in week four I might change that to the Cooper Run test. Yeah. Because I still get the same number come out based on the test choice. Yeah. Which is which is submaximal VO2. Awesome. Cool. Next question down. How do I start out on the budget? Neil's already answered this a little bit about how he done that with his boot camp in terms of just using towels and mats. So you don't have to go and get every single different type of dumbbell. Yeah. <laughs> every single kettlebell. <laughs> every single barbell. You are now a gym. I think let's, let's just break it back to, again, just keep it really simple, shall we? 
you've got to expect some outgoings in the early stages of setting like up. We like we said about insurance. Like insurance. Hayley said you might get QuickBooks, for example, for your admin, for your receipts and mm -hmm. your, your managing of your books. Um, you might buy some basic equipment. I think it's just knowing that in the first couple of months, there might be more outgoings than incomings. Nice. And I think that, that again, just hopefully settles the, the chimp in the brain that says, you know, I've got to be earning lots of money. How can I survive off this? You're starting something like new. You're starting a business and, you know, no business really. I'm, I, you know, but you can call me out on here as maybe a little bit of BS, but no business really has a home run and makes great profit in the first few months, right? So it's knowing that in advance. And the fact we do know it. I'm not expecting it instantly. I'm not expecting it instantly. Like yeah. if you go out and make a huge profit in the first month, like you've literally done what most 99.9% .9 of businesses don't do. The other thing that will help <laughs> here is to do what we call a pre-sale. So wherever possible, before you go and create the content of your mm. program, you sell it in advance of doing it. Um, so that obviously is a little bit easier to imagine maybe if it's say like a boot camp or something outside because the content is doing it. Um, but if it's say an online program, I hear so many times of people spending months and years putting together a program that they feel is perfect before they launch it and before they make any sales. Whereas actually you could sell that in advance based on what you know your client needs and wants and then later you can then be building it as they're rolling into the program. Because the, the, the biggest risk here is you could spend weeks and months building it and no one buy it. Craziness, yeah. right? So yeah, that'll help with your budget. Uh, next one down is how do I launch a fitness business with no time whilst juggling a full time job? What I love about this, <laughs> this is a great question. Is it's the same question we hear from revision. Yeah. So the same person asking this is probably the same person that had the same problem fitting in the revision. So you need to have that tactic, whether that is a oh, strategy, whether that is in your revision in your fitness business, it's the same thing. And I believe that comes down to doing little and often yep. and sometimes doing the work when you don't necessarily want to. I think you've hit the nail on the head, <laughs> doing it regardless of how you feel. So if we go back to the early stages of Parallel, I think this really we can really relate to this. So Hayley was in a full <laughs> Hayley was in a full time job um, as like a lead exercise referral working in a retirement village. Hayley had literally hundreds, uh, over 300 clients yep. at the time, all above kind of 55 60 years old yeah and all of them had medical conditions which is why Haley leads exercise with referral and level four is very really really well for us because it's first-hand experience and knowledge and then i was working um in reps as well and doing lots of freelance work i was going all over the country or in and out of the middle east lots of, uh, lots of tutoring knowing that we both wanted to set up parallel and there was this point of like right i need to be able to do this regardless of how I feel. And there was huge sacrifice and compromise. And I think that's maybe something that needs to be considered is what am I willing to give up? So I gave up some of my workout sessions. What am I willing to compromise? I was willing to compromise um, a good couple of nights per week cooking a healthy meal. I knew that I could pinch time from certain places in order to get nice. behind the desk, get behind the computer and make some good traction. I was willing to compromise um, my seven or eight hour sleep that I now get. Yeah. Part of the weekends. Part of the weekends. Some things had to shift. Some, some things yeah. had to give. And then friends and family would say, um, are you going to, do you want to come around for a meal? And I'd be like, I can't, I'm working. And they'd say, oh, do you want to meet up? And I'm like, I can't, I'm doing this. And it's knowing that for a certain period of time, it's not forever, mm. you have to dig a little bit deeper than you're used to and you're comfortable. So me and Haley have this analogy of a thermostat and we <laughs> turn the thermostat up in order to produce something. So we have three or four projects on the go all the time and every now and again, we well, every week we turn up the thermostat just a little bit in one of those projects and it puts our back against the wall. It makes it uncomfortable. Makes you work a little bit harder to get a bigger capacity to do more. That's that thermostat. I want yeah. more. And I think this is why we have to go back to se uh, se uh, season one last week, season two, episode one last week of why did we start? Mm. If we know the why, you'll go, cool, I'm, re I'm, I'm capable of spending another 90 minutes up and it's half past 11 already. Um, it's and crazy. And part of that, if you start off with a small chunk, as you turn that thermostat up, as you get into it, the things you're doing become easier or more natural yeah. and you can 
fit in more and more until you're ready to either make a full switch or if you're not making a switch you get to the point that you're comfortable i think it comes not down to as well happy. to being yeah completely so i think it also comes down to like self-belief mm. and believing that this is gonna pull off at some point <laughs> you might not know the full date but it does get pulled off and it all works and all the pennies drop and you're like yes it, it, it worked great yeah but also knowing that if you're let's say in a full-time job and you want to make that transition and you're building up this boot camp and you've got to hustle and compromise and sacrifice a little bit you've got to believe deep down that in three months time you're actually going to be handing your resignation into your full-time job or you're going to be having a conversation with your boss and saying i want to go part-time hours like there's got to be an end outcome here start with the end in mind start with the end so in again mind. it links to the last episode and the next episode when we talk about self-belief and the next question. The next question. Uh, which is if Yo, your this family is a great point. don't understand you and they think you're silly for wanting a new career in fitness. Like I hope this resonates because I, I do. I know a number of people that message just about this. But And the question was, my family don't understand me. But yeah. But, <laughs> and, and for a few of you, we won't mention any names because it's just not needed. But they said like, my husband doesn't quite get it. He's not fully on board. My wife thinks I'm silly for doing this. Um, a couple of people My have actually... My husband thinks it's a phase. A phase. Um, <laughs> the, the, even like the, you're grown up, <laughs> you're all grown up, but you're in that point where your, your kids have left home and they're questioning you as well. And then your work colleagues are going, are you sure you're going to go and do this? Like, why would you give up working here? You've got a good pension. Ignore the noise, yeah? They're not meant to understand you. They're not meant to understand mm. you right now. It's not their end outcome and their end goal. It's yours. Completely. Yeah. And again, go back to what was the end goal? Why are you doing it? So if we, we rewind to like 2011, 2012, you know, we were both earning respectable incomes. I was working in central London on a good wage. It was comfortable. There was a clear, clear progression. Yeah. I was working in a, a training provider as a general manager for mm. a major training provider that went on to do multi-millions. You know, we were doing very well. It was clear how I was going to move forward, right? And everybody thought I was silly. Like, why would you give that up? But there was something inside me that if I didn't, I didn't go after that thing that was eating me up, then I would have had lots of regret. I'd have like, I, that's not what I'm meant to be doing. I wasn't put on this planet to be in that organisation. I was put on this planet to be in my organisation. And everybody has a different gauge of success. Yeah. So for some people that could be um, having a high up job. Um, it could be the amount of income that you earn. It could be happiness in your day to day. It could be that you've got time to yeah. spend with your kids. Yeah. Everybody has a different gauge of that success. And your gauge of your success might not be the same as those in your family or Great those point. in your friends. So they might be like, you're mad for giving up that wage or whatever. And you're like, but this is more important to me. This is what I gauge as successful yeah. and I want it. <laughs> one, thing <laughs> I, okay. one thing that I've really, really enjoyed is, is, a, is a quote from my coach. And he says, first they ask why mm. and yes. then they ask how. Nice. Yeah. So eight years ago, they asked, why are you doing this, Neil? Why are you doing this, Neil? And now they ask, how did you do that? Could I pick your brains? How do you pull, how it, off? Do you pull it off? Yeah. So I'm just going to say they've, it's important for them to be on board, but they're not meant to truly understand the inner workings of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. Next, still on set up. Another still on question. set up is how do I take payments from clients? Cool. They give you the money. They give you the money. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of using Stripe. I think it's fantastic. Um, obviously PayPal is also an option too. Um, Stripe's good because it's quite a small percentage that they take um, in order to process the payment. You can either process the payment directly on the uh, Stripe portal, which is easier on desktop, I have to admit, um, or on app that they have, like a pay now app. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing about this is that you could take payment from your client with them sitting next to you on a talking consultation over a cup of coffee. You can put in their details and they can sign up then and there. The, the deal is closed. <laughs> you can do it over the phone. You can even have things like this for classes if, uh, in terms of like even a contactless on. Yeah, on there's lots of, of so international secured payment gateways, but Stripe 
um, is probably the number one one to use. And easy to the number map one across. One. Number one one. The number one one. Could give that a go. Cool. So we have got so many more questions. I'm conscious of the time ticking here. So I, I'm going to do them justice, but we're going to move through them legal, quicker. So, so John asks, as a new fit pro, do I need insurance and a license? And I'm training clients outside. So we've mentioned insurance. Yes, you do. In terms of using um, outside Absolutely. space, you need to get the landowner's permission. Um, so that could be your local parks trust. It could be the local council. It could be a private property. But yes, you do need to get permission from using that land. So first off, it's sourcing who owns that land and going and asking them. And there might be a small fee involved. And oddly, I've seen this a few times in, in, in various Facebook groups lately, is before coronavirus, people were using the parks and parks trust and they had a very easy relationship whereby it was yes you can use it have you got a risk assessment and have you got insurance and there was either a very small nominal fee or no fee but however post coronavirus obviously they want to make sure that you're doing a better job being more thorough they're yeah. asking for updated insurances updated um, risk, assessment. risk assessments but also asking for a fee ah. and i saw one fit pro i think this was towards the midlands the local council had set a fee on different times of the day oh wow and so his monthly that. fee to the council had gone from literally zero to 1600 pound a month because it was a hundred pound per slot Oh, wow. Completely. That's what hire a hall. That's insane. Exactly. <laughs> so my point here is just make sure that you do have the landowner's permission. Because the point here is if something should happen and your client does have an accident, even though you're insured, you're not insured to use that space. And now that could make your insurance invalid. It's like owning a car, getting mm. insurance and getting it mapped and changing it and adding things to it and not letting the insurance company yeah. know. And then you have an accident, they check the car over and say, but you've done X, Y, and Z to it. You're not insured, you didn't tell us. It's exactly it's the same also thing. Also, like if you had your own premises, your own house. Well, this is the next question for oh, Mira. Oh, hold on, no, okay. in a second. If you had your own house and somebody wanted to come and suddenly start teaching uh, fitness oh, on your great, own property, great point. you wouldn't really like it. So it's the same applies. Somebody might own that land, in which case it's not they don't want it to be used for something other than what they want it to yeah, be used so, for. So an example, you could be like, well, it's only a disused car park. No one uses it, but it still doesn't belong to you. Mm. Yeah, I could own I could own that disused field. Yeah, I'd be like, but it's my field. You're not using it. it. But even if it's just sitting there doing nothing, yeah. it's still my property. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so you want to make you wouldn't want anyone on it without you knowing. So it's just a, a respect thing, I think. Yeah, find cool. out who owns it. I think this leads nicely to Mira. Can you train from your house? Now, are there any special permissions and licenses? And I think this is a great question. And the answer is yes. So let's say, for example, you go, I'm, I'm not going to go in a gym. I'm not going to pay rent. I can't go in the park. I'm going to set up my own gym in the garage. You, you've now changed how you use your house. And so you would, let's just say you've converted your garage to a gym or a small gym or a studio it's not commercial by any means but you've changed the use of the garage mm. and now you're making revenue out of your garage you need to have permission to do that yeah and the various insurances to do the that the planning permission side of it changes uh, because of people needing access and because of uh, like parking e footfall music egress, music neighbors whatnot so yeah you need to again contact the your local um who to be council mm. to understand how you can go about and what you can and can't do but it's not as simple as i'm just going to use my garage and set that up with a treadmill x y and z because you've now changed the use of that particular um part of space. your house your space even though it's yours you're operating as a business you're operating just like the local gym down the road but you're not wanting to conform to the rules of that yeah. So yes. And the other side um, of that is obviously it's very different if you're doing online training and it's just you in your lounge doing an online video. 
that you don't necessarily need to do change of use for. No, completely. Because there's no other clients coming in. I'll just clarify yeah. that one. Cool, cool, next one. Chris, Chris, how can we change and operate in a new COVID environment? This is likely to be a fluid situation. It is a really fluid situation. It's changing all the time. And the main point here is it goes off the guidelines from government and it also goes off of your insurance. How can we change and operate? I think is a really, really simple answer. Bring as much value to your marketplace as possible, regardless of what changes. Yeah. Constantly add value to your social media platforms. Constantly go out to grow an email list. Email them every day. Reach out to your prospects. Reach out to your clients and add as much value. The more value you bring, the more equity you have in that marketplace, which means you have permission to ask for a sale, which means you have permission to... Um, challenge your clients even more, which means you are ahead of your competitors. So rather than think, you know, it's a really fluid situation, there's lots changing, uh, or oh, I don't know if I should do this, or can I do that? Mm. Just constantly think, how am I adding value to the marketplace? And this is something that we've We've pushed really hard inside Parallel. So right from day dot of lockdown, March 23rd, I think it was, um, we, we noticed a number of training providers almost take their foot off the gas. And I said clearly to the team, I said, we are going to push harder. Earlier on, we talked about um, sacrifice and compromise. I thought, right, this is the time to knuckle down. Everyone else is lifting their foot off the gas because there's so much uncertainty. But one thing I can be certain of is bringing more value to the marketplace. And the response has been phenomenal. What I love about this is that the tactics are changing based on the rules, regulations that are out there from government, insurance changes. Yeah. But the principle will remain the same. And that is the value that you give, just like Neil said. Completely. And we had a wicked podcast on that. And it was the, the principle never... The tactics will change, but the principles principle never will. Never will. Wicked. Yeah. So if you're struggling with your level two principles revision, go and look at that, watch that, uh, listen to that even podcast. podcast. <laughs> Get there in the end. Next question down. Who, Who can, can I, I train, train if I'm level two or level three? So level... This question yeah, comes up a lot. Great. So, and sometimes it's a little bit unclear. Um, the easiest way to look at any question like this is did you get taught <laughs> yeah, this is a, what an answer. <laughs> how oh. to work with that type of client? That's a great point. If you didn't, the chances are you can't work with them or you're not suitably prepared to work with them. So at level two, you're looking for an apparently healthy individual. Mm -hmm. Okay, You did do some uh, recommendations around exercise an for an awareness for older adults, pregnancy, younger populations so 14 up, 14 up and um disability. disability but let's say for example somebody comes to you with a um if it's, if it's in their second trimester or um 10 weeks post pregnancy they require somebody that is a specialist in pre or postnatal you're not qualified you've just understood the recommendations to guide them in the right place yes. you're working with somebody that's apparently healthy and then at level three it doesn't really get any broader than that. You're working with somebody that is an apparently healthy individual that passes a par Q. Yes. So if somebody comes to you with um, high blood pressure, high blood pressure, type two pain. diabetes, whilst there's an awareness of it, and in the grand scheme of things, not much changes from an exercise recommendation, there are different risks associated Especially so so something outside of this is is we use a tool inside exercise referral called the Irwin and Morgan Morgan risk stratification tool and this is a simple grid that this clearly highlights well. yes yeah, in the startup kit but clearly says who can I and can I not work with so anybody that is of higher risk so kind of high, low, medium risk, medium risk and high risk, we can't work with. Mm -hmm. So a level three PT is somebody can work with, but is uh, low, risk low risk, which would be apparently healthy individual, overweight, maximum BMI 29.9. Anybody over that, they are associated with different risks. Yeah. So it's knowing your boundaries. And you might be listening to think this and thinking that's a load of rubbish. And maybe it is a load of rubbish, but ultimately we didn't make this up. 
um, they have rules around your what your qualification allows you and to do. And they for a reason because the risk changes. So um, the clients that have more conditions or more stressors going on in their body, they've got a buildup of risk that is happening. You add exercise to an already stressed body yeah, great, and you're great more point. likely to have a risk. And that risk is going to be things like heart attack, stroke, making the condition worse meaning that they get more symptoms than signs either for that condition or for other conditions and also the the comfortability of your of your clients so let's say for example they are grossly obese and you don't consider the considerations for that condition then you have um, potential to really make them feel uh, self-doubted or self-efficacy, self-belief, self-worth, confidence. <laughs> got there. But um, you know, but yeah. the other side to that um, would be, and you've got a client in their early fifties, and they've got arthritis in the hand, for example. Mm -hmm. And you might think, "Cool, I'm going to train them first thing in the morning." Well, number one, number one thing is stiffness in the joints. Mm. So now they can't grip the barbell very easy. And so they might not tell you the ins and outs of actually how that feels. And you don't have that knowledge of what to do or what time to train or the, or the adaptations and, and alternatives to exercise Perfect. in order to match their condition. So really what it's... What what it learning exercise report. And that's what it comes back to, I think, in, in the PT certificate. Was, did, I, did it get covered? Did it get mm. covered, yes or no? If it didn't get covered, then don't train them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay that one to say no. Yeah. yeah, cool. There's one final point. If something does happen and you end up in a courtroom in a dock and they turn around and say, show me your insurance, show me your certificate, show me the park you, show me the consent form, etc., etc., and you've just got the PT certificate and this person is riddled with common clinical conditions, they'll be like, well, you're not insured, my friend. You don't have the adequate knowledge to back you up. Awesome, think, really well summed up. Yeah, we go, nipped in the bud. Cool, next awesome. question. Um, do I need a risk assessment? Yes, you do. Oh, we missed one, but that's okay. Yes, oh, did we? Oh, yeah. that's fine. Do I need a risk assessment? Yes, yes you, do. you do. There is a template for it inside the FitPro Startup Kit as well to help you, but definitely do a risk assessment. Next one, Nell, no. excuse me. When teaching a class, does everyone need a park you? Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> um, everyone should do a park you right at the very beginning. And if they, um, I would be inclined to do a park you periodically as well, just in case anything changes, but you're also going to do a kind of a session by session verbal screening as well, just to make sure nothing has changed. And then let's say, for example, you have a client, they do 12 weeks with you and then take three, six months out, go and do another park you with them. Yeah, if because if there's a, a gap or a, a, a pause in training, we don't know what's happened during that time or why there's a pause. You could do this as a paper park you where they fill it in. Um, or an online link is perfect. So go to one of the many form builders you can have, whether it's Google Docs or Wufu or whatever it might be, create a form and send it to them before they attend the Jot, class. Jot form is another one. Yeah, as well. cool. Send it to them before they have the class. The form then gets emailed to you. You've got record of it. Lovely. Cool. John asks, would I be expected to trust my clients if they say they have no unconditional medical history? Um, how would I spot the signs? Ooh. This is a this is I think one of the best questions. I so love this. So that's like trusting what they put on the park you, right? And at the end of the day, yes, you do. If they type tick no all the way down, you have to go with what well, you could challenge them verbally, and you could um, go a couple of questions deeper. And through a client interview, you might ascertain that actually the no is actually in fact a yes. It's also why the park you is so important because they've signed to say they have none. So as a result, if they've got no conditions, that's what it says in the park you, you are acting according to that knowledge. Yes. So that will hold you up. In Neil's court situation that's, a moment ago, that will hold you up. But I'm also a big fan of doing the park you with them present. Mm. So whilst we can send it to them, like Kaylee just said, using like JotForm or Wufu or Google Docs, I'm a big fan of sitting down with them and doing it. So on a our double consultation even if it's online i like to pick up the ipad go online and we fill it in together because now i can ask for questions and go a couple of questions deeper and go actually that would have been a yes that is a yes actually mm. because it's it's still my duty of care perspective of knowing what it means as well yeah completely so I've, I've been in that situation where a client has ticked no because they just want to get going they don't want to be in that position where they there's a whole host of reasons why they they might want to tick no instead of a yes 
Maybe they're embarrassed. Maybe they just want to crack on. Maybe they don't want my hassle. Maybe they don't want to go back to the doctor. Maybe they just don't want to tell you. Maybe that, that's just what they want to do. And it's their mm. prerogative to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, you've got to trust them. I think we've also got to take that with a real pinch of salt and go, how can I elegantly uh, get them towards the correct yes or no answer? Awesome. Nice. Cool. Um, do I need a music license? Only if you use music. <laughs> you could use uh, <laughs> yeah. royalty free music. Yeah. But if you're going to use the latest music, the local, the, the latest Ed Sheeran track, yes, you do. And you can, you might be listening to think, that's a load of rubbish. Ed Sheeran's got enough money. Why do I need to pay him? Um, just like the landowner, we mentioned earlier, that's his land. We're going to pay for use of his land. Or if you're going to go into the gym, you're going to pay for use of that gym. They own that. They've earned and worked towards owning that. Just like Ed Sheeran has built a career around music and he is going to be paid a royalty for his hard work, time, energy and effort. So regardless of what our thoughts and opinions are of he's got enough money or why should I have to pay that? Those are the rules. And I think if I think we can nip this in the bud. If you love his music enough to use yeah, it, nice. then surely you love his music enough to pay him a small royalty. Nice. So go to <laughs> PPLPRS. They've combined. It used to be two. Yep. Um, so they've combined. Go to there and they will give you all the information. You can hop on a call with them. Go through exactly how many classes or how many hours you're, you're doing activity for with... Um, with music and they will create the right quote for you. So yeah, PPL, PRS. At the end of the day, like if you get caught, the fine, the fine is, massive, is way it? bigger than your monthly or yearly fee for the royalty of music. So <laughs> it's yeah. like the risk there. Next well, one down is, do, do I, I need, need to, to register with ICO for GDPR? So who are the ICO? So the Information Commissioner Officer, Commissioning Officer, um, this is basically for GDPR, this came in place at the exact same time. Um, because you're handling data, they need an information log of all the people that handle data. They don't need all the people that you handle data for. Um, but essentially, you as a FitPro are handling data of other people. So you need to be registered with the ICO. Now, the, the easiest way to do this is literally go gov.uk um, ICO, and that will direct you to the right place. Then you can do a little test where you literally put in the information and it will be like a little quiz that shows you exactly what, like, what your needs are as a business, as a sole trader. Now, the chances are it's going to cost you about 40 quid a year. There are other ones that are higher than that, but we're not even at that level. You guys are not going to need to be at that kind of level. So it's probably going to be 40 quid for a year, but definitely make sure you are registered. Yes. And it might even be, but you don't have to pay anything. Yeah, but, but you're make registered. Sure you're registered. It's about being legal, decent, honest, and safe. Yeah. Marketing. Marketing. I'm not very techy. What do you suggest? Don't let technology be the hurdle here. You might think, I'm not very good at Facebook. I'm not very good at Instagram. I don't like face to camera work. You've got to start somewhere. And you might think, oh, how do I set this up? How do I do this? So there's a couple of ways. The easiest and like the free way would be go onto YouTube and say, how do I set up a Facebook page? And somebody somewhere has made a video of the full step-by-step -step of the latest Facebook algorithm. And you can go and do it. And you literally follow it step-by-step. -step. You could be like, how do I make sure all of my posts in Instagram are one by one square? And go and type into YouTube the exact question you have. And somebody somewhere, I 100% guarantee... There will be templates. There will be, a template. be programs, like, how do How do I... How do I use Canva? So Canva is a really good free tool to create um, content. And you might think, well, let's go into Canva, go to their help desk and go, how do I do this? Or go into YouTube. How do I do this in Canva? Somebody has made that. Now, the other side to it is you could go into our fitness business Kickstarter, um, yeah. which gives you the step by step to finding out who you want to work with, how you're going to work with them, setting up your signature program. Then you've got what we call the 4S engine, which is setting up all your systems, all your strategies, all of your stats and your for, for setup of your business, for statistics. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the starter system, which is all the sales, the sales scripts, how to go about asking for the sale and guiding the sale. Then you've got the ins and outs to Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, blogging. It's all in there. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like not being very techie, I don't think you need to be very techie. 
and just like anyone you've got to start somewhere and what i would say here is give yourself a challenge to work with one new thing at a time rather than trying to do everything all at once just go right i'm just focusing on facebook for example i'm not going to try yeah. and do instagram and youtube and everything else at the same time i'm just going to do one thing at a time and as i'm doing that one thing i'm gonna just look at doing one post a day Oh, yeah. that's a nice image post. Cool, I'm happy with that. Once you're happy that you know how to do that from a tech point of view, then Move challenge on. yourself to add in something new. Don't yeah, try cool. and do loads of stuff at once because you'll get like in this whole little lost maze. Just do one thing, master it, other Just thing. Just like a Load smart goal. On. Achievable and realistic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just keep it simple and go, rather than be like, oh, technology gets in the way, go and learn the one thing and do that consistently for a few days or a few weeks until you feel comfortable to add the next few things awesome nice question from alexandra she says how long do i pursue a specific marketing technique before changing tack because she basically has it all set up and then finds that she gets cold feet before it's uh, been given a long enough time to have any kind of uh, impact so she ends up going obviously isn't working i'll scrap it I, rather than giving it time i think it's, it's, it's a, how long is a bit of string but i do want to give a more definitive answer so we've been doing a morning parallel show on facebook live mm -hmm. and we are about 40 days into this so every morning apart from a sunday on our facebook page parallel coaching you'll have us live somewhere between 7 30 and 8 o'clock only for about 6 to 12 minutes okay 8 to 10 minutes max really and the first couple of days we got a really good response because it was something it was a new approach and people yeah. tuned in and were like oh there's new and Haley again and then we had a couple of weeks where the numbers weren't all that great on the live but the replay was really good and it would have been really easy to have ditched it at that point and thinking actually not many uh, people it doesn't, work. doesn't really work now then at the end of day 38 mm. We had 13,000 minutes of viewing. So somebody had, or a number of people, not somebody, people have watched those select uh, 38 videos and watched a grand total of 13,000 minutes. That's a lot. And now Facebook Insights could give me an incredible amount of data of what worked, what time was best to post, the ideal length, what type of title um, was it best for us to be in the office in a different room outside by the sea on the beach because we live down here in Plymouth in the UK um, and now I can follow success leaves clues so I'm gonna say the answer to this one is you're gonna leave it long enough until you can feel or see the success let's change that until you can see the success and the success clues could be that it's not working You've got to leave it long enough for you to get data to come back. And I don't know what marketing technique Alexandra specifically uses. I've actually been working with um, Alexandra and she's actually killing it at the moment. Cool. Yeah. I was going to say, I would add to that that you it's better to add something else before you remove the one that's already in place. Yeah. So you're not going back to square one and taking all the momentum out. I think um, it's also we need to be realistic. If you're just starting out, because this is what this is about, isn't it? Fit yeah. for a beginnings. You might think it wasn't very successful. I only got one or two, five, six clients. Like that is a phenomenal success. Yeah, a fen even if you sold one person, that's a phenomenal success. Don't beat yourself up. Like if that's the first person you've sold, when was the last time you've sold another person? No. Nice. Like you've got to like tip your hat and think, do you know what? What was achievable and realistic? You know, you're, you're not going to go out and change the world in the first few weeks or months. If you market and you, you've, you've tried Facebook Live and not many people listen, but at the end of a month, you've got one or two new clients. I say you've you you're on to a, a bit of a Mini win. Mini tweaks will help yeah. always. So like change Don't beat title. yourself up. Don't beat yeah. yourself up. Nice. Final question. Final one. Final one it's is Kate. Kate. How do I find my first clients when starting or restarting um, and package up an offer with good price and value for the right people? This is a big, hefty question. Isn't it a big question? And season two, do... episode four yes, is going to is going to answer this. This is what. We'll cue that up there. Yeah, and that, I think we'll also talk about it a little bit on the next episode where we talk a lot about uh, like self-belief. But how do I find my first few clients? I think let's just give a, a decent answer, but really wait till, till episode four for this one. Would be how do I find my first few clients? 
I need to know who my ideal client's gonna be in the first place. So like in season one, sorry, season two, episode one, <laughs> get my words out, we talked about who, make your mess your message. Mm. You've gotta know who you're Start going after. Start with the end in Start mind. Start with the end in mind. To know the client and their outcome that they're looking for, and that will be the foundation to you being able to find that client, but also being able to create the right package for them because you'll know what it is they want to get so, to. So Kate, obviously female, I'm just gonna go down the route of working with say busy mums. So you might put out on your social media the pains and problems of a busy mum and how you can incorporate exercise into their routine, how you can incorporate um, healthy eating, making sure you get out the door of the morning on a busy school run, having packed your own lunch. So giving them you know, valuable advice and guidance without the expectation of the sale on social media. They go, oh, actually, it's really good. I really like what Kate does. I, 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 I trust that she gets it done. Look, she, she practices what she preaches. She's a leader of this. This works for her. Why doesn't it work for me? I'm actually going to follow Kate a little bit more. And because you're consistent on social media and they follow you and they get to know, like, and trust you, when you do come to that point of kind of saying on social media, I'm looking for four ladies that want to... Uh, that are busy mums that want to do X, Y, and Z, they're going to be the ones that put their hand up and reach out. So start building the value up so front. So start building the value up front. Awesome. Um, and we mentioned about pricing earlier on in it as well and the value uh, of the right people. Yeah. Cool. Nice. I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Tons of... Do you know what? There was 25 questions. And there was there was a few more that on top of that. That was our top 25 that we kind of took from uh, from those that came through, which is amazing. Um, if you have any extra questions, you can reach out to us as well. But the biggest thing I would like to know from you right now is what has been your biggest takeaway? It might be that we answered your specific question and you're like, yes, I got a mention. Um, <laughs> or it might I be made that... FIPRO sessions. <laughs> <laughs> or it might be that the someone else's question led to an answer that you're like, oh my God, I didn't think of that, but I need it. Um, so definitely um, let us know in the comments if it's below YouTube or you can send us a message. I'll put all the links in the show notes. Next week, we're talking about uh, Fit Pro Beginnings, but from an internal perspective, we're talking about self-belief um, and understanding it from in here and all the things that, that stop Keep us, stuck. but also get us going as well, but all from an internal perspective. Boom. I just had a really good idea before we go. Awesome. I'm going to put it to you guys live. How about a season where we had maybe four weeks where we had a Zoom call with one of you guys, a learner, and we had a general discussion about a subject of your choice? So if you're a specialist in, I don't know, pre and postnatal, let's jump on and I'll interview you all around pre or postnatal. Oh, I like it. And then we'll blog you and we can then push you and you can put out a on your... A season of guest fit pros. A season of guest fit pros. How would that work? So it could be anything. We could talk any subject. I don't mind. We could have three or four people on. Yeah. Let's see if that works. See if that works. Outside of that, we will see you bright and breezy next week for episode, episode three. number three. See you later. Bye. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Hayley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work and that with the right structure, support and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching.